This past Tuesday was the 63rd anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which was the trigger to bring America into the war, the Second World War. As the following day, President Roosevelt went before Congress and talked about this day that will live in infamy, the surprise and unprovoked attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. But, of course, by now, almost every historian in the world who has paid any attention to it knows that the attack was no surprise whatsoever, that the United States knew that something was happening, that there was an attack coming. The only disagreement is over whether the attack would, uh, pardon me, the only disagreement was over whether Roosevelt and other high government officials knew the attack specifically would be at Pearl Harbor. In any event, they did not warn the commanders at Pearl Harbor that they had knowledge that the Japanese were about to do something. That knowledge came because America had long since broken the Japanese diplomatic code. In fact, for two years they had been reading all the secret messages going between Tokyo and all of the embassies around the world, and of course especially the embassy in Washington, D.C., where two Japanese high-ranking negotiators were discussing with Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, how to end the differences between the United States and Japan. And on November 26th, Cordell Hull issued a stern warning to the Japanese, ordering them to get out of China, ordering them to give up all their conquests in East Asia. And it was obvious to anyone that the Japanese were not going to do this and that the Japanese would see this as an ultimatum leading to war. They also knew that the Japanese would want to start that war with a surprise attack somewhere. They also knew that the Japanese diplomats had been warned that if this were not resolved quickly, things were going to happen, as the Japanese officials in Tokyo put it. With all the arguing over whether or not the Roosevelt administration knew the attack was coming at Pearl Harbor and whether they sufficiently warned the Pearl Harbor commanders and all of these other things, one important aspect of this has been lost. Because if they knew the attack was coming at Pearl Harbor and they didn't do anything about it, then, of course, we can say they were very bad officials, maybe even treasonous officials. If they failed to warn the commanders at Pearl Harbor, then we can say they were derelict. But all of this means that this could be prevented from happening again by just having the right people in office at all times. And we've learned many, many times over since 1941 that there is no guarantee that you'll have the right people in office. The important salient fact about the Pearl Harbor attack, about the whole beginning of World War II for the United States, has been lost in all this, and that has to do with a principle that is universal and that does not depend upon who is in office at any particular time. And that salient fact is that the United States government was browbeating the Japanese about something that was of no business of the United States whatsoever. The Japanese live in a small island. We hear often about Iraq being the size of California, how huge, huge that is. Well, Japan is smaller than the state of Nevada. And Japan is a small country on a group of islands with no natural resources to speak of. They even import the rice that they eat, the tons and tons of rice. And Japan was doing business, trading with countries and colonies in East Asia. And at some point, the British, Dutch, and French, all of whom who had colonies in East Asia, began to cut off the Japanese from the resources that the Japanese wanted to sustain their economy. The Japanese were also very afraid of the communist encroachments into China. And so the Japanese occupied a country called Manchuria, which is really the northern part of China, and they renamed it Manchukuo and set up a government there and a capital and even got a few countries of the world to recognize it as the lawful government of that area. The point is that we have heard often, or at least those of us who paid any attention to World War II, how the Japanese were conquering these various areas by force. But what we don't realize is that the areas that they were conquering were areas that other countries had conquered by force and were now colonies. The Japanese moved into Indochina, which was the final last straw as far as the Roosevelt administration and the Dutch and the British were concerned. But Indochina was a colony that had been conquered by France. Singapore was a colony that was conquered by Britain. Indonesia, as we know it today, was the Dutch East Indies, a colony that had been conquered by the Dutch. So essentially what the Japanese were doing were taking over areas that had been conquered by other countries, conquered by force. It was simply a matter of which country would impose its forcible rule upon any of these. Now, why the United States was interfering in this is something that no one has ever satisfactorily explained. Nothing that the United States needed was in jeopardy. The United States was not vulnerable in any way whatsoever, but the United States was in trying to impose its will upon the Japanese and blaming the Japanese for trying to impose its will upon others. The lesson, of course, is 
that if the United States had not been browbeating the Japanese, the Japanese would never have attacked the United States. They attacked the United States only because they realized that winning a war with the United States was almost impossible. And the United States was threatening Japan that war was going to ensue if the Japanese didn't stop their conquest. And the Japanese, knowing that the odds were very long against beating the United States in a war, decided that the best thing to do was to knock out the United States Navy at the outset. And Roosevelt kept the entire Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor as sitting ducks. When he ordered the Pacific Fleet to be moved from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, the Admiral in charge, the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Richardson, resigned because he thought it was such a bad idea. And he was replaced by Admiral Kimmel, who then took the blame for the attack on Pearl Harbor. In any event, we learn a lesson from this, that when the United States messes with other countries, the United States gets burned and people die. I'll be back in just a minute. We'll wrap up the subject and go on to others. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and I was talking about Pearl Harbor. And I said that the essential universal point involved, which applies to so many other situations, is the question, what was the United States doing browbeating the Japanese? The United States had no direct in interest in anything the Japanese were doing, and yet Roosevelt was determined to get the Japanese to stop doing it, or he was determined to provoke them into an act of war. Uh, we now know that Roosevelt had carried on secret correspondence with Winston Churchill and had assured Churchill that the United States would come in at some point and support the war, even though Roosevelt had run in 1940 on the promise that your boys will never fight in a foreign war. And, of course, this is not unusual to provoke a foreign power into uh, attacking the United States in order to start a war. The same question comes up with regard to the Spanish-American War. It began when the U.S. battleship, the Maine, was sunk by an explosion in Havana Harbor, uh, Havana, Cuba. And that uh, got the United States started on the war against Spain because Cuba was a Spanish colony at the time. Uh, the problem was that the Cubans were fighting for their independence, and the Maine sailed into Havana Harbor, and a few days later it was uh, subject to an explosion that killed a number of people. And the question is never asked, what was the Maine doing in Havana Harbor? The question has always been, who caused the explosion? And it seems to have been determined that it was a problem with the battleship and not a, uh, an explosion set off by anybody, not the Cubans, not the Spanish, not the Americans, not anybody. In World War I, before the United States got into it, Wilson continually encouraged cargo ships, American cargo ships, to sail into war zones so that they would become targets of German submarines who knew that the cargo ships were sending munitions and other uh, essential war goods to the British. So on and on it goes. We need to find a way to prevent politicians from dragging us into war. We need to find a way to keep the politicians from exploiting these matters to try to raise public outcry and get Americans to want to go to war. Most people do not want war at any time because they know that their children or their grandchildren could be called up, they could die in the war, and they do not want that to happen. Plus, they don't want to risk the possibility that our own cities will be destroyed. Americans have been so blessed by being in what I have always called a good neighborhood, with Canadians on the north, Mexicans on the south, and two huge oceans on the east and west. And as a result, there is no reason for America to get embroiled in anybody else's wars. We're not going to go to war with Canada. We're not going to go to war with Mexico. And so we have to be dragged into European or Asian wars, wars like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and, of course, all of the invasions that have been committed by American presidents, invasion of Grenada, of Panama, of Iraq twice, and, and on and on it goes. And so they, they need an incident always. Well, I devised what I call the Peace Amendment to the Constitution, and at the next break I will put a link to it on the Radio Links page, and that page you get to just by going to my website, harrybrown.org, and just click on Radio Links, and you'll get to links to articles and websites mentioned on the show. And there are a lot of them from previous shows, but tonight I'll put the Peace Amendment up there. I'll also put an interesting article on Social Security, uh, which uh, if we have time we'll get to this evening and talk about on the air. In the meantime... Let's go to Michigan and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Good evening, Mr. Brown. Thank you for having me uh, on your program. Yes. I'm an admirer of your views, and I think that I'm pretty much sold on the libertarian message. But I have a question about something that was brought up on a previous program. Uh, somebody had talked about um, Lake Michigan and entities like that and how they would be uh, addressed in the libertarian society. And I think that your answer was that a private company or you know, private individuals would own something like Lake Michigan. And I guess that that sort of troubled me and was making me think, because this is something that, um, being sort of a public good, a lot of people really are able to enjoy. And if it was something that was owned by either exclusively by private individuals or by a company, I don't know that that would necessarily be something that so many people would be able to enjoy anymore. Well, it's... The same thing goes, I, I think, for things like the Grand Canyon or for any other uh, publicly held lands that 
so many people get pleasure from. Well, suppose Disney World were uh, owned by the government now, whether it be the government of Florida or the government of the United States or whatever, and still they manage to handle millions of people coming through every year. If somebody said, gee, I wouldn't want to have Disney World owned privately because then those millions of people who enjoy it every year would no longer have a chance to enjoy it. But that just overlooks the fact that owning Disney World is absolutely useless unless you make it available to the public in exchange for money. What's happening now, of course, is that people pay money to go to national parks. They are charged fees and all kinds of uh, different costs directly to them, and yet we are afraid that if private companies were to take them over, gosh, we'd have to pay for these services. Well, we pay for them anyway, not even to mention the enormous amount of taxes. The difference is that when we pay it in taxes, it's buried in budgets, and we have no idea how much this is costing us, but you can imagine that it's going to be much, much more than uh, what you think it is because they always manage to find ways to bury these things in other parts of the budget. But let me make something very, very clear. I have not heard any libertarian advocating the sale of Lake Michigan. You didn't even hear me advocate the sale of Lake Michigan. I just pointed out how Lake Michigan could be better handled if it were privately owned. We have more important things on the plate right now. What we have to do is to begin at the top with the, with the federal government and get it out of all the areas that it has no constitutional authority for and use the savings to repeal the income tax. We need to end this drug war so that your children will not be hit upon by drug dealers at school or on streets anymore. We need to get America out of Iraq. We need to uh, institute a foreign policy that does not put America at risk. All of these things are immediate and pressing. And well, when, well, I, I agree with you 100% with all of those issues. Right, and, and when and we I get, also agree that those are of a higher priority than uh, absolutely. the minutia. No, no question about it. And when we get done with that, then we can move to things that are less pressing at the moment and keep finding ways to get government out of our lives, to reduce the use of force to organize things and get back to voluntary methods that we once had in this country. Hang on, Rob. Uh, we'll be back right after this break, and we can continue this conversation. This is Harry Brown. Hello again. Harry Brown here, and we're talking with Rob in uh, uh, Michigan, trying to fix the price on what we're going to sell Lake Michigan for. Rob, you still with me? I am. And I have sort of a follow-up question to this whole issue about property. Um, and, and I realize that this isn't something that should probably be real high on the libertarian agenda, but when I'm selling liberty to my liberal and conservative friends, this is a question that's actually come up several times, and I find it somewhat difficult to respond to. And I think part of it is that uh, Lake Michigan and the Grand Canyon are entities that are, that are different from Disney World in the sense that if they were in private hands, the most profitable means of using them might not involve uh, having tourists or families uh, visit them at all. So I, I guess I just wondered, um, if when you're selling liberty and trying to talk to people who are asking you that specific question, uh, how, to, how, to present the, how to present this issue. Well, I don't think the issue needs to be presented at all because it's not a current issue. When, when we get rid of the things that are so pressing right now, there may be arguments among libertarians about what the next step should be, and okay. we'll deal with them when the time comes. Uh, I just hope that the time does come <laughs> when we have to argue about them. Uh, I just hope it happens in my lifetime. But it's not really important now. The, I think the way to put it is that if we agree that government is inefficient, that government is unjust, that government creates unfair situations, that government is taking from people what uh, they have earned rightfully, then what we want to do is reduce government to the absolute minimum. And we can't tell at this point what that absolute minimum is going to be. And we're just going to keep uh, working to get, take force out of human action as much as possible and replace it with persuasion as a means of getting things done. And how far we'll get with that remains to be seen. Well, um, I want to give other callers a chance, so may I ask just one more question? Sure, go ahead. Let you answer it. Uh, my question is actually about uh, related to what he began the show on, which was about uh, World War II issue when you are talking about war is atrocities like the Holocaust and about people who have a high uh, amount of emotional investment in an event like that. Sure. And about still talking about why the United States doesn't have business going over there and still trying to um, show compassion towards people who may even have, um, you know, within just a few generations, a personal attachment to that event. Uh, I'll hang up and let you answer that. Thank you. Yes, well, if I understand you correctly, I, I think it is important to show compassion for people who have been hurt by these things. But the compassion, unfortunately, is very selective. People are concerned about the Jews, Poles, Gypsies, homosexuals, and others who were killed in Nazi concentration camps. But, of course, very, very little compassion is expended towards the people of Dresden who were firebombed mercilessly night after night by the British and, and American air forces, even after the war was lost for the Germans, but just simply as a means of of uh, pummeling them into submission so that they would demand a change from the Nazi uh, regime to end the war. But, of course, if those people had any control over the Nazi regime, they would have deposed it long ago because the Nazi regime was just as brutal on the Germans as it was on any nation that the uh, Nazis conquered. And those who uh, worry about what happened to people uh, that were hurt by the Japanese in the Pacific never seem to worry about the firebombing of Tokyo by Doolittle's forces and by the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were absolutely 
not necessary to end the war since the Japanese had already set out, put out many, many feelers to try to end the war. Uh, the fact of the matter is that war itself is an atrocity and that the only way that you are going to end things of this nature is to end war itself. Now, we can't wave a magic wand and put an end to war in the world, but the first thing we can do is to make sure or do everything we can to make sure that our government does not contribute to the atrocities of war. By that, I don't mean that our government should be pressured to fight war cleanly, but that our government should be pressured not to fight war at all. Now, would that have stopped the Holocaust? As a matter of fact, it would have. Because if the United States had not butted in to World War I, the war would have ended in an armistice between the Germans and the Austrians on one side and the Russians, French, and British on the other side. The result would have been that the Kaiser would have stayed on his throne in Germany, the Tsar would have stayed on his throne in Russia, and we would have never had Hitler in Germany or Lenin and Stalin in Russia. And there would have been no Holocaust, no concentration camps in Germany. There would not have been a gulag in uh, the Soviet Union. There would not have been millions and millions of people killed and brutalized by the communists and German regimes. That doesn't mean that if the United States had stayed out of World War I, that there would have been no more wars? Of course not. But it would have meant that this is the greatest compassion. If we could write, rewrite history, the greatest compassion would be to keep the United States out of World War I. That would have saved the six million Jews, the uh, probably five or six million gypsies, uh, Poles, and homosexuals, and other people who were murdered by the Germans. It would have saved all those people who were murdered by the Soviets. And all of those people would have been alive as testaments to, to the virtue and the joy of being alive. And they are all dead, and all of their descendants have to mourn over them, just as their wives and families had to mourn over them at the time. Uh, and today, people are mourning over people dying in Iraq. Not just Americans dying there, but Iraqis dying there, and the people who should not be dead. And we blame it all, of course, on the insurgents, the resistance there. But the fact of the matter is, why is America there? And that's the same question that should have been asked in 1940. Why was the United States browbeating the Japanese? It's the same question that should have been asked in 1898. What was the battleship Maine doing in Havana Harbor? What was the United States doing pushing cargo ships into war zones in 1916 and 1917? What was the United States doing in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s? Why was the United States involved in the Civil War in Korea in 1950, 51, 52, and 53? Why are so many Americans dying year after year after year in these fruitless enterprises that are supposed to stop communism in the world, supposed to be bring peace to the world. As George, uh, Charles Beard put it, it is the perpetual war for perpetual peace. And every one of these wars promises us, us a better world when the war is over, and that better world never arrives. We have got to do something to keep our government out of wars. And until we do, there will be these atrocities. We'll be back in just a minute. This is Harry Brown. You can call 1-800-259-9231. But in the meantime, so as not to keep Steve in Oregon waiting, let's get right to his uh, question or comment of the evening. Good evening, Steve. Hi, Harry. What's well, up? On your, on your opening statement, you didn't talk about how FDR moved the Pacific Fleet from San Diego to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And do you know what year that was? I believe it was in 1940. It could have been as early as 39, but it was no later than 1940. Because very few people know about that, and even fewer people bring it up. And it, it's something that just dumbfounds me, because um, it was Admiral Richardson that resigned, correct? Yes. He wasn't the only admiral. Uh, they uh, pulled, I think, all the Pacific Fleet admirals, and they were all against it. And FDR overrode them. Uh, because all the other admirals said it was too dangerous to be that far out in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I think the FDR was setting up an, ob an obvious snare, and the Pacific Fleet was debating the snare. Yes, it would have been much, much more difficult to have a surprise attack on, on the fleet in San Diego. It would have just undoubtedly been uh, forewarned because of patrol planes and, and just normal shipping around in the Pacific uh, coast, off the coast of California mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, that it, it just would have been impossible to have a sneak attack on San Diego. But Pearl Harbor was a different story. And... Uh, this, this also brings up something else, if I may divert our attention for a moment. We think of wars as being these battles between efficient uh, armies uh, against each other, navies and air forces and so forth. But in my studies of World War II, I have been struck by so many uh, decisions that were made by the politicians as to where the troops should be deployed, as to what should be uh, attacked next and so forth, things of this sort. Many of these decisions re resulting in just absolute horrendous disasters where tens of thousands of men got, got killed because it was such a lame idea. But this is what the politicians wanted for political reasons rather than for military reasons. And a lot of that happened in Europe. 
uh, at, at the time that the British and the Americans had the Germans and Italians cornered completely in, in North Africa and were about to win the Battle of North Africa, and finally, once and for all, Churchill ordered a huge concentration of troops to go to the Balkans instead, where they were slaughtered, and meanwhile, then the Germans and Italians recovered in North America. Um, we can, mean North Africa. Uh, pardon me, North Africa, <laughs> yes, uh, and that battle then had to go on for another year. Okay, hang on, Steve, if you like. Uh, we'll be back right after the news, and don't you go away, folks. we got another hour to go. We are on the phone with Steve in Oregon. We've been talking about Pearl Harbor and the so-called surprise attack, which was a surprise to everybody in the United States except a lot of people in the government. Uh, what did you want to add, Steve? Well, well, since you did that little segue in saying that Churchill lost a lot of troops by moving them from North Africa to the Balkans, that's a repeat of what he did in World War I when he tried to seize the Dardanelles. The Battle of Gallipoli was an absolute disaster. They, yes. never, got, they never got more than 1,000 yards of beach and lost hundreds of thousands of men. But anyway, what I wanted to say was, to me, it's completely apparent that the... Um, you, you were, I don't know if you were saying it rhetorically or not, that you didn't know why the United States picked a war with Japan? Well, uh, apparently it was as a way of uh, getting into the European war uh -huh. through the back door. That, uh, because what I didn't mention is that Roosevelt had sent a lot of ships into harm's way, hoping that they would be attacked by German U-boats, just the way Wilson had gotten German U-boats to attack uh, American shipping and used that as an excuse, which caused him to go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. Only it didn't work in the Second World War. The Germans didn't fall for it. They did everything possible to avoid attacking American ships. And so... I, it seems pretty apparent that Roosevelt was browbeating the Japanese, hoping that they would make some attack someplace, knowing that the Germans would probably come into the war then be, uh, against the United States because of the tripartite uh, treaty between Germany, Japan, and Italy, which said that if any one of them got into a war uh, against somebody that they weren't in a war at the time they signed the treaty, that the other two would come into the war also. I believe that exactly. And it, it's like you're bringing up. Most all the wars, especially of the 20th century, have been brought about by devious means into places where we had absolutely no business being. And uh, you're that sums it up very well. You're probably aware of Smedley Butler, aren't you? Yes. Well, uh, for those who don't know, Smedley Butler was a Marine general. He was one of the only two people who ever got two Congressional Medals of Honor. And after a full career in the Marines, he said, war is a racket. That's the book he wrote. And he said his final conclusion was there are only two things worth fighting for in the military, the borders of the United States and to protect the Constitution. And I don't think the American people will ever learn that. And I don't know of any war in which they did that. <laughs> no, they never have. And you, if you listen to other talk shows, it, it just frightens me to know in how people are so gung-ho for war, and they're talking about war with Syria and Iran and anyone else they can seem to jump into a war with. They're well, I, I, you're very articulate, and I hope you call into some of those shows and raise a counter point of view. One of the things that really gets me about all these discussions about war, and it pertains also to the Second World War and the First World War and so on, is it doesn't seem to matter to anyone how many people die. Just so some, some political objective is achieved, it will be worth it then. Gee, it's too bad we lost 15,000 men, but look at what we have achieved. Well, you didn't happen to be one of the 15,000 men. Boys, boys, they're boys. I'm going to disagree with you on that point because they're just in their teens and early 20s. Yes. Good boys. Well, uh, and of course they joined the Army not having the faintest idea what they're getting into in a lot of cases. Absolutely. There, there was an interesting article I found today that over 5,000 uh, American soldiers have deserted because mm -hmm. of the Iraq War. I had not heard that before. 60 Minutes did an issue on that on 60 Minutes 2 Wednesday. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I'll, I'll dig up that article and put that on the website as well. That's 5,500 that they know of, and they think there are maybe 10,000 that just haven't reported so far. Yes. I'm all for them. I, I don't care what other people say. I'm all for them. They don't need to go. One last thing, Harry, before I leave. Sure. I can understand why you didn't garner a lot of votes when you ran. You're too rational, too polite, and you don't have any jingoistic cliches. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. All but right. I, think, I think there are more reasons than that, but that's all right. Okay. <laughs> I think there are too. <laughs> thank you so much, Steve. All right. Goodbye. All right. Now let's uh, jump across the ocean and talk with Daryl, who is in France this evening. And I take it that's not France, uh, Montana, or France, Ontario. No, it's not, Mr. Brown. It's actually uh, it's, it's France in Europe, actually. I thought so. Uh, I, I, you know, I've been a libertarian uh, since 1990, uh, and uh, I vote in every election. And uh, sometimes I wonder why, uh, because I, I think, you know, everything's just been pretty much hijacked. Uh, I, I do it as, a, as an act of faith rather than, than any hope of uh, ever changing anything, because as I see it right now, we've, we've sold ourselves out to a criminal enterprise. And I'm wondering, uh, and my question is, um, I mean, this latest war, of course, is, is, uh, is just one in the long line that you've been discussing tonight. We, we, we've got a lot of evidence that's being um, put forward today that this last attack in, in New York was a staged event as well. And um, I'm wondering uh, what kind of uh, approach the Libertarian Party is trying to take with, with some of this evidence and some of the Spitzer stuff and, and some of the, uh, the other evidences that are coming forward. Um, and, and I, I cite, uh, the, uh, what's his name, uh, Mr. Rupert's book, uh, Michael Rupert. He's done an extraordinary job of bringing forward uh, many points. Not necessarily that, that all of them are are, um, are uh, provable or cogent, but they are they are they are certain uh, certainly serious questions are being raised. And I don't see anybody addressing them. The mainstream media has been bought and paid for with drug money, and I just see rot from center to, to left and right. And I'm wondering uh, what what your, what your take is on this whole mess. 
Well, first of all, the Libertarian Party has not taken a position on anything having to do with an inside job, uh, if I may put it that way, as far as the 9-11 attacks were concerned. And I haven't either, because I really don't know what happened, and I have not explored that. I just felt that there were enough things that I felt I could get an answer to to uh, justify spending my time on, rather than speculating on something that I might not be able to come up with any provable evidence one way or the other. So I haven't followed that as much as you have, obviously. And I, I would not be surprised to find out someday that there was a lot of of problems connected with it, that there were people inside the government that had some awareness that something was coming and did nothing about it. That, that's, it's worse than that, um, um, Harry. It's, it's, a, it's a great deal worse than that. In fact, it was, it, it, there's, a, there's a body of evidence right now that says that they did it, not, not, not allowed it to happen, but actually perpetrated the act. Well, and we really, I really urge you, I really urge you and maybe other libertarians listening tonight uh, to take a look at this evidence that, that Michael Rupert has put forward in a book called Crossing the Rubicon and Road to Crawford, Texas. There's another book out by another man. Uh, you, you need to really read these books. They're both about 700 pages. They're extraordinarily well written and, and very well cited. And uh, I think it's it's almost uh, I, I'm I'm a little bit hurt that you haven't uh, spent the time to do that because this is this is more serious than uh, than just an accusation. If in fact uh, if you read that and you come to the conclusions that many of us have, then what we've got here is uh, is is an, an act of treason and an act of mass murder. And in order in order for you to maybe um, you know. Uh, uh, take a stand on this. Maybe there, you, know, you could maybe move this, this issue forward, and I think it's, it would behoove you to take a look at this. Well, you raise there an important question, and I like to stay with the things that I think I can do something about, and I'm not sure if I found myself agreeing with you that there's anything that I really could do uh, about it, because as we've seen, this is an unmentionable subject in the press right now, and I would prefer to spend my time talking about things that can get some traction. Well, shame on you, Harry. Shame on you, Harry. And it's not that I'm, I'm going to it's deny something. Shame on you, Harry. Well, hang on. We'll talk about this some more when we come back. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown. And we were we were talking to Daryl in France, who said, shame on me for uh, not getting involved in the question of the possible government conspiracy to bring about 9-11. What I was trying to say was not that I would shade the truth or that I would shy away from the truth in any issue simply because it was unpopular. I don't believe anybody can possibly think that of me since I wrote on, December, on September 12, 2001, the first in a series of articles called When Will We Learn, in which, in the midst of all the hysteria and the desire to go over and nuke the Middle East to get back for at the Arabs for 9-11, I wrote that it was the doing of our foreign policy that had created this. So I don't think I need to apologize in any way for that. But what I won't do is spend a lot of time trying to unearth the truth about something, and I don't know what that truth is, but I will not spend the time trying to unearth it if I feel that even finding some sensational truth, that there is very little that can be done about it or to get a hearing for it. I would rather devote my time to areas where I can get a hearing and where I can uh, make some progress and where I can help some people to better understand these things. And I think that there's another aspect of this, too, and that is not so much who is the villain in a particular case as to what is the villainous uh, act. And the villainous act here is not really what happened inside our government prior to 9-11. It is what our government has been doing openly and covertly for the last 60 years. And that is what has caused all of these problems, and that is what, is, what must stop. Even if we could determine that somebody inside of our government was responsible for 9-11, that actually hired the hijackers and paid their families and whatever else it took to get them to ram the 747s into the World Trade Center and the uh, Pentagon, that wouldn't change American foreign policy, even if we could convince the American public that somebody in our government had done it. What we would get would be a bunch of congressional hearings. Uh, we might get uh, Bush to fire a whole bunch of people and maybe even get Bush impeached if we could show that there was uh, something that he knew about this and didn't do uh, about it, or even that he was the instigator or whatever might be found. A whole lot of people might be pilloried as a result of it. But American foreign policy would still continue to go on causing problems and causing people to hate us enough to want to hurt us as badly as they can. No matter who caused 9-11, there is no question that there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who hate America now, the country that was once the best-loved country in the world. And what we have to change is the policy of our government, the bipartisan policy that has run on a straight line through Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, and Bush. Democrat and Republican, Democratic Congress, Republican Congress, you name it, it's always the same. And that is what has to stop. And finding that somebody committed some dastardly deed inside the government is not going to stop that. 
And that's why I say I would prefer to deal with something that goes to the heart of the matter and on which I have an opportunity to talk. You don't hear much discussion of the, about the Iraq war or anything else on television that concerns itself with the consequences of American policy. But you know something? You hear a lot more about it now than you did three years ago or four years ago, before 9-11. As little as you hear, it is many times what you heard four or five years ago. And so we are making progress. We are bringing this whole question slowly but surely to the surface. And who knows, maybe in 2008 or 2012, some president will have the, some presidential candidate of uh, one of the two major parties may have the courage to speak up and to say that the policy itself is wrong and has to be changed. I hope you understand the distinction, distinction because it is critical. It is crucial if we are ever going to get anywhere in this world. You know, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago on the program with regard to the origins of the Federal Reserve System. It doesn't matter whether a bunch of bankers got together on Jekyll Island and plotted to create a Federal Reserve System because it would be good for them. This is no different from the people who may have plotted in secret to bring us farm subsidies or to bring us aid to education. Maybe it's the NEA uh, got together in a secret basement of the Congressional Office Building and got together with uh, uh, various congressmen and plotted to stick the tentacles of the federal government into education. So what? The problem is the result, not the people who caused it. And it wouldn't be any better for us if the Federal Reserve System had been created openly uh, in every possible way by well-meaning congressmen who wanted the, the best for America and thought that this was going to eliminate inflation and banking panics and recessions and depressions and so on, and why shouldn't we have a central bank like Britain does and so forth. It's still would have been the disaster that it has been. So we waste an enormous amount of time talking about the origins of these things instead of talking about the consequences of them and what it means to the individual, how much better the individual would be if we didn't have a Federal Reserve System and how much better the individual would be, how much safer he would be and how much more secure he could feel for himself and his children if we didn't have a foreign policy that went around the world drumming up enemies everywhere that it goes. Do you see the distinction? God, I hope you do. I really do hope you do. We can spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out who the culprits are when it's not the culprits that are the problem. It's the policy that's the problem. Because you get rid of the culprits and they're replaced by other culprits. You change the policy and people see the benefit of it and become determined not to let the bad policy take over again. We need to restore freedom in this country. I want you to live in a country where you do not have to be afraid of foreign attack, where you do not have to be afraid that your children are going to be drafted to go fight somebody else's war somewhere in the world, where you don't have to be afraid that your city is going to be targeted in a terrorist attack. That's what I want for you. And the way we're going to get it is by helping the American people to realize the disaster that the foreign policy has caused and how beautiful, how peaceful, how secure the right foreign policy could make America. We'll be back in two minutes. This is Harry Brown. Well, we have a question from Ashley in Tampa, Florida. In the news, the nominee for the Homeland Security Chief position dropped out because he had hired an illegal immigrant as a nanny and failed to pay taxes on her wages. Would it be hypocritical to give him the position? Or it would have been hypocritical to give him the position. Many Bush supporters are claiming this was an innocent mistake. <laughs> and then in parentheses, Ashley says, Who would expect a police chief to know the law? End of, parentheses, end of parentheses. But what about the other hardworking immigrants who are automatically labeled as threats because of their immigration status? Bush's proposed guest worker program is a joke. What employers would want to hire people they know will have to leave after they've learned their job well? Only employers wishing to exploit immigrants for hard labor. No incentive for immigrants to learn skills and become productive citizens. When I make my case for open immigration, the biggest argument you get is that they receive too many benefits. In your opinion, is it important to end the welfare state before we push for open immigration? Well, there are several questions here. I like the fact that you pointed out that the police chief is supposed to know the law. And if the police chief claims that he didn't realize until just recently that he had broken the law with regard to this illegal immigrant, why is it they expect the rest of us, who, for whom the law is not our business, to know what the law is. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. It is a very important excuse. I mean, we have found out the congressmen don't even know what the laws are that they passed. They're always coming up with, oh, I didn't know the law contained that. This is terrible. We need to hold hearings and repeal this part of it, and so on and so forth. Now, as far as the uh, Bush guest worker program, I agree with you that it is a mistake 
to put this on a limitation of time, which means that, as you point out, only unskilled labor is going to be hired and used this way, that to teach somebody how to perform a particular job is fruitless because the guest worker is going to have to go back to Mexico or wherever about the time he's beginning to be productive for you. And with regard to the question of should we get rid of the welfare state before we push for open immigration, I'm afraid I look at it in a different way. We have open immigration already. That's what everybody's complaining about. The fact that the borders are porous, that immigrants are pouring across the border, that there are millions of people in this country illegally, and they keep telling us that we should not be for open immigration. Well, we are not. don't have to be for or against open immigration. Open immigration is about as controversial as whether or not there is air uh, surrounding us in this universe we live in. The fact of the matter is the borders are open, the borders will remain open. There is nothing the federal government can do to close the borders any more than they can keep drugs out of this country, any more than they can bring democracy to Iraq, any more than they can educate our children pro properly, any more than they can run a health care system. There is not going to be closed borders. And that's what people have to understand. And if closed borders are a given, if the fact of the matter is that there is no way you can shut the borders that I know of, then you better learn to live with it. And how do you live with it? You get rid of the welfare state. Then you don't have to worry about these illegal or legal immigrants coming in and sopping up the money that you have worked so hard and wanted to put aside for your old age but instead was taken from you in Social Security taxes and then diverted into the general budget to provide welfare benefits for immigrants, legal or illegal. Yes, we need to get rid of the welfare state. And when we do get rid of the welfare state, only people looking for opportunity will come into America legally or illegally. Whereas now we have people coming in looking for opportunity, and we also have people coming in looking for free welfare benefits that are much more generous than what they would have gotten going on welfare in their own countries. They can walk into any old hospital in the country and demand free health care. They can put their children in schools. They can get driver's licenses and so on. The answer, of course, is to get rid of the welfare state, but it's not a question of which comes first, get rid of the welfare state or have open borders. We have open borders, and they are always going to remain open. You could put a uh, Berlin Wall across the southern border of the United States. You could put the one-mile moat that Pat Buchanan suggested. You could do all of these things, and they'd still find their way in here. Uh, look at all the people who escaped from East Germany, around and under and over the Berlin Wall. It, it always is that way. All these things do is to create a symbolic gesture to indicate that the politicians have done something. If they add a million more people to the border patrols, it still isn't going to stop the immigrants from coming in. But it's going to make it look like the incumbent is really doing something. And somebody in Congress who voted against it, uh, against having the million more men on the border patrol, will have to face uh, his opponent in the next election will say, who will say that he, he, the incumbent, really doesn't care about the immigrant problem and this, that, and the other thing. Just the way Bush kept saying over and over and over again that Kerry voted against uh, body armor and so on for the troops in Iraq, which incidentally, it turns out, the Bush administration wasn't supplying anyway. I don't know if you heard the final outcome of that Rumsfeld brouhaha. He went to Kuwait, talked to the troops, and lo and behold... In the question and answer section, a session, uh, somebody asked, "Why aren't you providing body arm? Uh, why aren't you providing armor for the Humvees and the uh, tanks, uh, so that we don't have to go rummaging around through scrap heaps and so on, finding stuff and welding it on ourselves?" And Rumsfeld, in one of his many gaps, said, "Well, you fight the uh, war with the army you have, not the army you wish you would have." But it's, he said it was a matter of physics and logistics, not a matter of money. We want to get that stuff to you, but we, they just can't be produced fast enough. And then, lo and behold, the next day, the company that makes those armored Humvees said, "We can turn out quite a lot more than we are, but we're not getting the orders from the army to do so." So, despite the fact that it's not a logistics problem, the armor still isn't getting to the uh, troops in Iraq. So there. Bush complained that Kerry hadn't voted for the army, armor. The armor passed, but they still didn't get it to Iraq, which points out once again that it is all show. It is all just much ado about nothing. They vote on these things, they make big deals out of the vote, and nothing ever happens the way they promise that it's going to. And we are not going to close the borders with Mexico or Canada, not because people don't want to, but because it's impossible. And I've been threatening all evening long to talk about this Social Security article that appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle on September 12th by Carolyn Lockheed. And having used to live in the Bay Area, I believe that's the correct grammar, having once lived in the Bay Area for 12 years until 1995, I read the Chronicle and I came across a number of articles by Carolyn Lockheed uh, who 
seems to be quite good at exposing the foibles of what goes on in the government. She also wrote for a while, I believe, for the Washington Times and Insight magazine. And she had a very extensive article on September 12th about the Social Security situation and pointed out that while the politicians say, yes, we've got to do something about Social Security, got to put it in the lockbox, got to do this, got to do that, she said that they grossly understate the problem that exists. And she quotes U.S. Comptroller General David Walker as using the word chilling to describe the budget outlook. And Leonard Berman, co-director of the tax policy for the Urban Institute, says the long-term budget projections are just horrifying. I've got four children and it really disturbs me. I just think it's irresponsible what we're doing to them. And she mentions that they have these figures that they bandy around about the debt already incurred now at four and a half million and the Congressional Budget Office uh, issuing a 10-year budget forecast showing uh, $422 billion deficit this year and a $2.3 trillion deficit over 10 years. And she says, quote, but these figures, worrisome enough, are deceptive because they ignore future liabilities, such as Social Security and Medicare payments to the baby boomers. An array of government and private analysts put the actual U.S. fiscal gap, which means all future receipts minus all future obligations, at $40 trillion. That's trillion. Uh, which comes from the Government Accountability Office, to $72 trillion, which comes from the Social Security Board of Trustees. Now, she points out that these are not sums, meaning it's not just a gross total of all the excess uh, expenses over the receipts in the years to come, but they're present value figures, which means that they are whatever those future liabilities are in terms of today's money, which is always less. If you pay something today, it's a lot less than if you pay it 10 years from now because of the interest that accumulates over the 10 years. So these are present value figures heavily discounted to show in today's dollars what it would cost to pay off the debt immediately. And the International Monetary Fund estimates the gap at $47 trillion, the Brookings Institute at $60 trillion. And Leonard Colt uh, Kotlikoff, an economics uh, professor at Boston University who's written on this for years, I've read uh, previous studies he's done, says, quote, to give you an idea how big the problem is, you'd have to have an immediate and permanent 78% hike in the federal income tax to pay off all of these liabilities. And he says these obligations are not imaginary. Unlike the 1980s and 1990s, economic growth cannot bail out the government now, the way the Bush administration would like us to believe it could, because the baby boom retirement is at hand. Those born in 1946 will reach age 62 in 2008, allowing them to take early retirement and start drawing on Social Security. Now, another study by Jagadish Gokhale of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and Ken Smitters, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, whose work I also have read previously. They've studied this problem for years. They did a study commissioned by former Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, and they estimated a $44 trillion fiscal gap. And it said, here are different ways that you could meet these liabilities. More than double the Social Security tax immediately and forever from 15.3% of wages to nearly 32%. Or raise income taxes by two-thirds immediately and forever. Or cut Social Security and Medicare benefits by 45% immediately and forever. Or eliminate forever all discretionary spending by the federal government, including the military, homeland security, highways, courts, national parks, and most of what the federal government does outside of the transfer of payments to the elderly and interest on the national debt. Now, the interesting thing about this to me is that Rome is burning. There is a fiscal crisis on the horizon. It may be a year away, five years away, ten years away. Nobody can predict it. But while this burning is going on, while the fires are already on the outskirts of the city, the politicians continue to talk as though nothing has gone wrong and that it's just a matter of a little bit of tinkering. And they are still proposing new government spending that they don't have the money to pay for. In other words, they are just pouring more gasoline on the fire. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Please stay tuned. And thank you very much for listening tonight. And thanks to Scott Hartman for taking care of everything in uh, Minnesota. And we had a uh, very good email from Pierre who is uh, somewhere out there in cyberspace and says, it is normal for people to be intrinsically skeptical. And this has to do with the conspiracy question that came up earlier. And he's, Pierre says, governments that generate mistrust and which continue to act covertly transform normal skeptics into conspiracy theorists and even extremists. I find that this can be a barometer of government's failings. A truly open and transparent government would probably breed fewer people on the fringes. This isn't to pass judgment or to deny minority views. It is only to echo that your sage sentiments, sentiments that it is essential to strike at the root of tyranny rather than to prune its branches. And that's a very, very good point, that it is the way the government itself acts that 
uh, breeds all of this mistrust and this feeling that there must be secret conspiracies going on. And any denials by government, of course, are laughed off because the government has been so wrong and so devious in the past. So I appreciate that from Pierre. And I want to apologize to other email writers to whom I didn't get uh, this evening. I will save those messages, and I'll try to address them in next week's show. And Andrea in New York... Uh, are you with us this evening? Yes, Mr. Brown, how are you today? We have two minutes before we're going to be off the air. Is there anything you'd like to say in one minute? Well, I wanted to follow up. I really, I look at, you know, our Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, makes really no argument at all for um, free trade, which is British commercial colonialism or British colonial commercialism. And, you know, for, uh, for the libertarians, I think, to think that that is okay and violates the Constitution and that we're going to continue to, um, you know, indirect taxation was really preferred by the founding fathers because that would promote business among ourselves. And that's ideally what we want to do. I mean, that's really what builds wealth in society, when we all do business with each other and have, and, and have equal respect for each other in, this, in our rule of law society. But we've, we've so drifted from that. And, I mean, you can look at the Fabian socialism that seems to have parasited itself into our, into our framework of government. I don't think it's just policy. I think there are people. I think but you could point to policy. So, okay. But I'll call into the time. We'll, we'll take well, why, why, don't you, why don't you call next week, Andrea, because this is a very important subject, and uh, there are several things you've said that I'd like to discuss. Good. But I'd like you to be present at the time so we can talk By about it. By all means. Great. Thank Thanks you so much. You're welcome. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for tuning in. I love doing these shows on Saturday night. I love having you here. I'll talk to you next week, so don't forget to come back. Bye-bye. <laughs>